I'm Ward Cooper, your host on Change Your Voice, Change Your Life. In studio with me is uh, the famed um, writer, Dr. Columnist. John, columnist Dr. John Curtis, um, who is the co-author of the book. What is the title of it? Uh, we're, uh, this is Conspiracy no, Reality. That's the subtitle. Oh, okay, of the show. The book yeah. is called Curing Hopeless Voices. Spasmodic Dysphonia. Well, it's treating... An yeah. alternative to Botox. It's an alternative to Botox because and Botox appears, appears to be close. I think maybe you could actually say that they do have a monopoly in the field right now. Oh, they do. Can you say that? Yes. Allegan, the maker of Botox, has a Because what other option is there besides Botox dysphonia. at this point? Yeah. What other option is there? Uh, basically none. They run the field and they fund uh, organizations such as the National Spasmodic Dysphonic Association. Aren't there antitrust laws? information on uh, the treatment and uh, they have handouts which uh, the medics give uh, across the country and perhaps around the world. Yeah. But I mean, aren't there laws against... Uh, monopolies and antitrust legislation. I mean, Botox is claiming an exclusive, almost an exclusive uh, treatment. There is a competitor for in doing Botox or something like Botox, but uh, they have a basic monopoly from what I know and what I hear. But my understanding is in your field that Botox isn't approved to, to treat the strangled voice uh, by the FDA. It's not approved by the FDA directly. It's an often or off-label drug which means that they have never gone to the FDA, uh, which is, how do you define the FDA? Well, that's the Food and Drug Administration. Okay. They have not gotten direct approval. You have to go through phase one, phase, phase two, two, and, and phase, phase three, three trials. They have not done so. And, and how are they, they able to I, use this drug? Well, here's the point. It's an orphan drug. Once they use it for face or whatever else they're using, they can use it for anything else. But they for don't anything? have to report negative outcomes if it's an often or off-label drug. So they don't, and the state-of-the-art treatment of choice is believed to be Botox for spasmodic dysphonia. And even though there are serious side effects from it or ineffective outcomes, contrary to what they're saying, how effective it is, from my experience clinically, it is not uh, that uh, effective. Uh, all too often it's ineffective, but they don't have to report the ineffective outcomes because it's not a direct Approval well, by it's the not FDA. approved, and usually when a drug is approved, it meets two criteria. Did you know that? Well, it has to be reported. Well, a, mm -hmm. a, it has to be safe. Mm -hmm. Okay, has to be proven to be safe. Mm -hmm. B, it has to be proven to be effective. Mm -hmm. Well, they're claiming ha it's it safe. Has, and Bo effective. has Botox, in your mind, as a treatment for spasmodic dysphonia, met those two criteria? of A, is it safe, and B, is it effective? I have uh, questions about that, and I challenge their statement. It's, uh, it's effective, not only in that respect, but I have seen serious uh, uh, consequences of... Of uh, safety, a drug safety issue? Yeah. Okay. Right. So but you don't believe that Botox for the treatment of spasmodic dysphonia, the strangled voice, is either safe or effective? I question its reliability from my clinical experience. I question its uh, safeness. Uh, we had a young lady on the Fox News Network who said uh, she had seri serious consequences from Botox for SD. Uh, I have heard that what before. What about John I've Fondale? Uh, yeah, he indicated that it was He a, said he was bench pressing 350 he had pounds. He was at a major medical center. Before receiving yeah, Botox injections, and then he reported here on this show. Mm -hmm that after receiving the Botox injection, by the way, he said it was not a bee sting. Yeah. He said well, it there's was a recent study out that says it's not a bee sting. He said it was horrendous, yeah. horrendously yeah. painful. Yeah. But apart from that, mm -hmm. we're asking two things. Mm -hmm. Is it safe and is it effective? Now, Fonville reported on this show mm -hmm. that he was bench pressing two, 350 pounds before his Botox injection, and afterwards he couldn't lift his thumb. Mm -hmm. He was weak as a cat mm -hmm. after the injection. Now, a very well-known wife, I mean, that, that's a heck of a claim to fame, a mm -hmm. wife, mm -hmm. but forgive me for the sexist implication here. Mm -hmm. Her name, uh, well, her last name is Metavoy. Her husband is a well-known movie director. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's Sharon Metavoy. I think that's her name. She received Botox on an off-label use. Now, she received treatments where they injected her in her temples for, I believe it was migraine headaches. Mm -hmm. 
and she became permanently disabled, according to her claim. Mm -hmm. She couldn't function. Mm -hmm. She couldn't uh, engage in the most basic activities of daily living, mm -hmm. like putting her, going, bathing, showering, mm -hmm. fixing food, doing any basic skills. She was permanently disabled as a consequence of Botox that were injected into her temple region mm -hmm. to control migraine headaches. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as I know, Botox is not approved by the FDA as safe and effective for treating migraines, mm -hmm. but it is a tr it approved for furled eyebrows, mm -hmm. the lines between the brows from an injection in that area. Now, the interesting thing about your field is that I... But that was I, a court case, and it was settled against the Metavoice. Well, I, I think it was settled out of court, but I, I don't no, know. If, not that I know of. Well, in any case, whatever whatever it was, uh, you, you have an issue with uh, the those two aspects of it, whether mm -hmm. it's safe or whether it's effective. I don't find it anywhere near effective as what it's being brooded about. Well, they've said it's 99% effective. I don't find it uh, anywhere in that category. I see these patients, I hear from them in email, I talk with them by phone, I record them with their permission, and that uh, position is uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, inappropriate, if I may say quite appropriate. But okay, so that's as far as I can tell. Here's another question. Yeah. Do you believe, based on the clinical experience that you've had patients who come into your office and report their experiences with Botox. You have no direct experience with Botox yourself, do you? No. Have you ever been injected with Botox? No. Do you ever have any intention no. of being injected with Botox? No. Okay. So you have only anecdotal experience and clinical experience with other people who have had Botox injections. Yes. With respect to your field. Yes. That is, for treating their strangled voice. Right. So the question is, for, uh, is, if you do not see the efficacy of Botox because your clinical experience through these uh, clinical case records of these mm -hmm. patients and their stories to you is that it's not effective in treating the strangled voice. No, it's not as effective as the uh, drug company would like it to be or makes out to be. They have their own view of what's effective. Okay, but let me let me go let me let me uh, follow safe. up with this. What I'm asking is on the basis of what you've seen, what do you think the chance is that Botox could ever be approved to treat spasmodic dysphonia? If I, the criteria that the FDA uses mm -hmm. is it must be safe and it must be effective. What's well, an interesting question is challenging. I think the courts would have to decide that in the FDA. But when I mean, I, just on the, just on the, the, just speculating, conjecturing just a little bit. We don't have to go that far. But wouldn't it appear, just as a, a lay person who doesn't mm -hmm. work for the FDA, mm -hmm. that if they use the criterion, two criteria of safety and effectiveness, we don't know about safety mm -hmm. other than what we've heard and what you've experienced with other patients. You, don't, you can't attest to whether it's safe or not. No. But what you can attest to is that it has not worked in a number of cases with patients that you've treated? All too many cases are not uh, talking about the positive outcomes for Botox okay. or SD. So given that, wouldn't it be reasonable to infer based on if the FDA uses the criteria of effectiveness or efficacy, mm -hmm. is that Botox will probably not be approved for treating spasmodic dysphonia ever? That's a possibility. But there's another situation that really should come to the fore, and I think this is the issue. I report cures for 35 years and more. I have peer review of strangled voices, spasmodic dysphonia, cures. The presentation of cures is on a DVD. I have two hours and um, I have printed material which says that there are cures and names the names. It was patients giving up the right of privacy and confidentiality. And I, we also mentioned the doctors involved. At UCLA Medical Center alone, I report 15 cures. I used to be on the staff and faculty there in the head and neck division. What's very interesting is that the medical profession overall, overall, rejects cures out of hand. It cannot be. They in the medical profession have never reported a single cure of spasmodic dysphonia dating back to Ludwig Trog 
in 1871. Well, that, that's very compelling now, information. Now, Traub said, uh, he described the condition, but the fascinating aspect is, why does the medical profession deny cures in the face of cures, which are right out there? I presented cures at Cedar sinai in 1982 and 1990. I was re-invited. I presented cures at the Fallon uh, HMO in 1998. I presented cures at the Pacific Voice Conference in 1998. I have presented cures over the period of years in the American Speech Language Hearing Association four times, as late as 2000. Yet my my field, the American Speech Language Hearing Association, denies choice of treatment and says, guarantees in writing there are no cures. The American, uh, the, the medical associations, the medical profession says there are no cures. So there is a tremendous disconnect. How can one lone doctor in the world report ongoing cures for over 35 years in the entire medical profession on all its websites, guarantee there are no cures. The American Speech and Hearing yeah. Language Association guarantees in writing there are no cures. The National Spasmodic Dysphonic Association, which is funded by Allegan, the maker of Botox, guarantees there are no cures, as does Allegan. Well, that, it's, I, so I, that's it, the, the story I believe. It's a stunning, it, it's a stunning disconnect. Yes, that's what I find. But I, I find it. But, but it's very explainable, we can, mm. and we can get into the explanation for that. I think it could become obvious to people why those cures are not accepted, or cures are actually uh, loathed. It's a dirty word. It is a dirty word. You use that to begin. It is a dirty yeah. word. Uh, but the real issue is we're talking about science, okay? And at various times, you've been, I don't know if accused or implicated as being a charlatan, a, uh, somebody who doesn't subscribe to science. As a matter of fact, you've been told by different individuals in your organization that you've wanted to present your cures uh, uh, through ad advertisement to disseminate information about before and after clinical case studies of patients that you've treated for the last 35 years, uh, cures of spasmodic dysphonia, recoveries and improvements. They have denied you access to that because you do not have scientific proof. I spoke with a leading researcher in your field, well, the field of treating spasmodic dysphonia with, mm. with molecular biology. Mm. Her name is Dr. Christy Ludlow. She's with the National Institutes of Health. Okay, she's a very uh, prolific researcher. Mm -hmm. And I asked, she was presenting a conference, and I asked her whether she wanted to have an innovative treatment, mm. state-of-the-art treatment, uh, at the conference. And she That's said, 2003. In 2003. And she Sponsored by Allegan. And, she's, and she, she told me, that Dr. Cooper has nothing new to report. I said he's reporting cures of spasmodic dysphonia. Mm -hmm. So she asked me in that conversation, she says, if Dr. Cooper, if Dr. Cooper is willing to, to submit to phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials, then we will allow in him. the FDA. FDA clinical trials, and we will allow him to present. And they I don't have it themselves. But I asked her that question. Allegan doesn't have direct approval from the FDA. They don't have direct approval. No. So and she doesn't have phase one, phase two, or phase no, three trials. No. So, no, I want to go back to something you said before. That's a leading researcher in, yeah. your, in the field. Of they don't have market. approval. Here's something that uh, is fascinating. I hope you will bear with me, folks. Um, my field will allow me to present cures in the American Speech Language Hearing Association, but they deny me the possibility of a referral in their SD spasmodic dysphonic uh, um, site, official site. Unofficially, I am reporting cures in this association, of which I am a lifetime member, but they will not allow referrals to direct voice rehabilitation. Now, I find that very interesting because they refer to the NSDA, the National Spasmodic Dysphonic Association, or to the Dystonia Medical Group, also funded by Allegan, the maker of Botox. Now, why is that? That's the question I'm asking. You have the subtitle of this program called... It's Conspiracy Reality. And I have a question mark at the end, and you say, no, it's a conspiracy. Uh, I'd like to, the audience to decide. I'd like people watching this program to decide for themselves what's going on. Why don't we allow patients who have 
Botox, who don't want Botox, who are told Botox is a state-of-the-art treatment of choice, and I asked for whom. Why don't they allow the patients who are finding that Botox is not working for them, and there are a number of them, to have choice of treatment? Why is that this association, the premier association in my field, probably in the world, in denial, affording patients with spasmodic dysphonia a choice of treatment? Wouldn't they themselves, when they have a condition diagnosed as hopeless and incurable, seek a second, third, fourth opinion? What is wrong with this association that remains in denial to give choice? Well, here's the, here's the linkage that we, know, we now know, and I've talked directly to the um, director of the NSDA, the National Spasmodic Dysphonia Association, and I asked her, could you give me the figures as to what percentage of funding you received from Allergan Inc., the maker of Botox? Mm -hmm. And she told me I'd have to look up the figures at the IRS. The IRS would have to inquire for me to get the figure. I mm -hmm. said, well, are, are, you funded, or are you funded by Allergan Inc., the maker of Botox? And she says, I'm not at liberty to, t to it's tell right you. on their website. Well, this is what I, I pointed out to her. I said, you have printed on your website an admission. A, a disse you're disseminating that Allergan, you're funded by generous donations from Allergan, Inc. It's on Allergan's website as well. It's funding uh, the NSDA. So, and yet and she, the, won't, she won't admit that they're funded by Allergan, even if it's on their website. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they're willing to hide that... And just to go back to the leading researcher in the field through the National Institutes of Health, which is supposed to be a disinterested organization. It's supposed to be. The I asked is her whether she's ever received the researcher, leading researcher. Hmm. Very simple question. Hmm. Have you ever received any remuneration, compensation, stock options, any kind of financial hmm. interest whatsoever from Allergan Inc. over the last 10 years? I said, hmm. have you ever received any compensation from the, the maker of Botox? And she said to me, I can't answer your question. Mm. You must go to the Freedom mm. of Information Officer mm. at the National Institutes of Health. So I said to her, you can answer, you won't answer. Mm. And that was the end of that conversation. Christy, yeah, sorry. So I went and we filed under the Freedom of Information Act with the National Institutes of Health. We wanted to know, is the leading researcher publishing study after study mm. on the efficacy of... Of, of Botox for treating spasmodic dysphonia, among other things. I said, is she on the payroll of Allergan Inc., the maker of Botox? Isn't that a reasonable thing to mm. know for anybody considering the value of mm. that and the objectivity mm. and the, the uh, trustworthiness of, mm. of that research? And they sent me back, uh, you know, official envelope mm. sealed by the National Institutes of Health, and in there were contained emails and the emails that she had were emails of events that she was sponsoring with, uh, by, funded by Allergan Inc. Mm -hmm. of meetings. Mm -hmm. And the emails contained statements of, thank you for the conference. We had a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. It was a very enjoyable event. Yeah, they don't it had absolutely cures. nothing to do with whether she was paid mm -hmm. and is, in fact, on the payroll of Allergan, Inc. Now, it's not, I, and I said to her on the phone, Dr. Ludlow, it is Elias Zerhouni, mm -hmm. who is the, he's the director of the National Institutes of Health, has made it perfectly clear that you, as a, a researcher, are allowed to have a dual relationship mm -hmm. and to receive compensation and consult, have a consulting relationship simultaneously with the um, National Institutes of Health. You can have a consulting relationship with an outside pharmaceutical company. It's not illegal. Mm -hmm. Why won't you answer the question of whether you receive compensation from Allergan, Inc.? Mm -hmm. I can't answer your question. Mm -hmm. She's on the masthead of the NSDA, National Spasmodic Dysphonic Association, and that association says on its uh, masthead that it's not to take a, a position on any drug, not to endorse any specific drug. Any one treatment for spasmodic treatment. Dys dys dysphonia. And it, and it certainly does that in the NSDA, in its website, and in its newsletter. 
and apparently uh, those involved with the NSDA, they may be in violation of their charter. I think it's an interesting situation. Uh, the question is who will investigate and what's going on. But in this case, you sort of have the fox doing the investigation of the chicken coop. Mm -hmm. Because as long as they're in control of the investigation, mm -hmm. uh, who's receiving money, direct payments, uh, support from Allergan Inc., mm -hmm. it's very doubtful. Look, I talked with a lady, a very lovely lady. Mm -hmm. I think you know this woman. Mm -hmm. And she told me, I mean, her name is Peggy Akins. Mm. Akins with an S. Akins. I and met she, her. And she told me, mm. I asked her, I said, you know, what, what do you, how do you, what do you want Dr. Cooper to do? Mm -hmm. She says, I want him to stop reporting cures. Mm -hmm. I said, why? He said, because he's a, he's a rebellious person, mm -hmm. and I want him to be more liked by the, by the field, so I've encouraged him to stop mm -hmm. reporting cures mm -hmm. of spasmodic dysphonia. And she told me flat out, she said, Allergan are wonderful people. Mm -hmm. I think they are, too. They're wonderful people. And by that, what she was referring to is they, A, pay her salary, mm -hmm. and B, sponsor, and she was the head of coordinating national meetings right. sponsored by Allergan, disseminating on state-of-the-art treatments mm -hmm. for spasmodic dysphonia. Right. But I asked her, why isn't Dr. Cooper included to present an optional treatment? Mm -hmm. Which are cures. Because they don't want cures. <laughs> and the issue comes down to this, folks. If there are cures of the so-called incurable voice problem called the strangled voice, which Robert Kennedy Jr. has, and if you listen to him talk, you have some concerns. If you listen to Diane Rehm, who has spasmodic dysphonia, she's on NP. Our radio and one of the sponsors is Allegan, the maker of Botox. Uh, if you listen to them, uh, you have to ask yourself what's going on. But the issue is what is Botox uh, doing for those with SD? Does it work for them? Is it making their life better? Is it fulfilling their career? And are they on Botox four to ten times a year, each and every year for life? Yes at a cost of one to four thousand dollars per shot, a full employment act, a lifetime annuity for the bo those doing those shots. Uh, apparently there may be only two hundred of fourteen thousand three hundred doing that. Um, but I don't even think you're begrudging physicians the right to no, earn a living administering no, Botox. You're not, not even opposed to Botox no, shots, are no, you? No, no, I'm not. I, I mean, they've I gotten the wrong impression. They, I, I you won't try it yourself. In the book that we wrote, try it, Botox, see for yourself. Uh, try uh, surgery, see what happens. Uh, surgery was the state of the art uh, treatment of choice in the early 1970s. It lasted for 20 years, and it, uh, the American Speech Language Hearing Association has indicated on 1994 and on that two thirds of those who underwent the surgical procedure uh, at that time, state of the art treatment of choice, like Botox is said to be today, are worse off than before. That's the official position. My position is that. Uh, Botox may be in the same category that two-thirds of those who are undergoing Botox for SD may be in the analogous position as were surgical cases. Two-thirds of those are worse off than before. That's uh, my take on what's going on, listening to patients, reading their email, listening to them on the phone, and so forth. Yet they're told that Botox is a state-of-the-art and treatment of choice, and my question is very simple, for whom and why? The medical profession and Allegan and the academic world, the American Speech Hearing Language Association, all guarantee there are no cures of spasmodic dysphonia, the strangled voice. It sounds like this. And the eyes are popping, the face is strangling, and the neck is taut, the body goes haywire. These people live a hellish life. I report cures of the condition. I don't guarantee cures. I report cures. All these entities, the establishment, guarantees there are no cures. I must be doing something wrong because the cures are peer-reviewed and I've been reporting cures for 35 years. Something is amiss. Dr. Well, Aikens told me, I mean, just, you know, on this She came to the office off in the October 14th, year 2000, yeah. and said, if I don't report cures, but I said, Peggy, I have peer review of cures. If I don't report yeah. cures, they will refer to me. Uh, Peggy, there are cures. <laughs> And she was not interested in cures. She was interested in me recanting, and I told her, I'm sorry. 
I don't recant. I report ongoing cures of this condition year after year, recoveries, improvements, all naturally. And this is, I think, why this whole problem is occurring. I am somewhat of a threat to the Elegant Company, which is the monolithic, huge outfit. Well, realistically, let's be honest. I don't exist. Please, please. I'm a fly you on the Elegant. You are not a threat to Allergan. Please. The vast majority of their Botox sales have nothing to do with SD. That's they correct. They have to do with cosmetic applications. Now they do. And, and then they have other applications. Yes, I, they have many I just read an article in the Los Angeles Times mm -hmm. by their CEO who said that he has potentially 100 applications. Mm -hmm. he's, he's interested in treating female sexual dysfunction, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, migraine headaches. I wish headaches. them all, Dr. Curtis, I wish them this all drug, well. This, this drug was Botox called. Botox is not fulfilling what, in, from this my drug, experience this what drug was, they are saying it does. Yeah, this drug was referred to by, I believe it was a physician in New York. We have one minute left. Now. Okay, this is, this is essential. This drug was referred to by this physician in New York, a respected neurologist, Mitchell F. Brin, mm. uh, in the New York Times as, I believe, the next penicillin. Mm -hmm. That was on the front page, 2003, March 2nd. And yet, they're featuring a drug that is one of the deadliest toxins known to man that's mm. been diluted in therapeutic doses mm. that doesn't cure any condition that I'm aware of as the next penicillin. No, it's temporary, so it's ongoing, and that's what drug so companies So what does that love. tell you about... It, it, look, they want to do temporary. If the drug companies <laughs> all cured problems, they'd be out of business. <laughs> Dr. Curtis, uh, conspiracy, reality, whatever it is, thank you for joining with me. I'm Mort Cooper. Change your voice, change your life. That's what I do all naturally. Bye-bye.